This message is the second in a three-part series entitled, Let Love Lead the Way. It was shared by Pastor Alan Galloway on July 17, 2022. We hope it blesses you today. Hey, everybody got their love on? Yeah? Let me see. I need to borrow someone's car. <laughs> is that like the test of love? Like, ah, oh, yeah. It's in the shop, right? Hey, we started a series last week talking about love, and it specifically came out of a question that Jesus was asked. Uh, it was a really important question. In fact, I pose it's an important question for you and I today. It's the question of the greatest command, or what's the greatest law regulation? And how many laws were there? 600, yeah, 613. Go ahead. If you're taking notes, go ahead and write it down. Not taking notes? Write it down. Write it down. Go ahead. Uh, 613, and what's remarkable is that Jesus didn't pick any one of the 613 laws. He did what? He summarized something. Jan just referenced it, Deuteronomy chapter 6. He took that passage or that command with Leviticus 19, and he kind of smashed them together. And he says, this is the greatest. In fact, let's read it together. Matthew 22, let's read this together. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, is the first and the greatest. This is the first and the greatest of all the commands. But then he goes on and does this, right? And the second is like it. Let's say it again. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Now that wasn't completely unique in Jesus' day to take one passage of Scripture and another passage and to bring them together. What was really unique is the implication behind what he was doing. In fact, we go on and we see Jesus say, I'm going to give you a new command. John 13, verses 34 through 35. A new command I give you, Jesus is telling his disciples. Love one another. Turn to the person next to you. Say, do you love me? I love you, Justin. (laughs) I love you, bro. Uh, Love one another. You got your love on today? Because if not, we've got some extra love suits in the lobby. We can just put that on. Love one another. As I have loved you, Jesus said, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are a Republican. (laughs) That's not love. That's not love. Nor Democrat. Nor independent. Nor green. Nor constitutionalist. Nor libertarian. How many am I missing? A few more? By this, everyone will know that you are my, what? Disciples. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Right? It's not a word that we use a lot today, um, but I think it's an important word. A disciple, a, a follower of Jesus. And why would people know? If you love one another. Now, when it comes to the idea of love, there are a lot of myths I don't know if you've recognized that, at least from when you read the word to compare to the world and the world's definition. In fact, what are some of the myths that, uh, that come to mind when you think of love? This is what love looks like. This is what love is. How about love at first sight? I'm not going to have you raise your hand uh, if that's, uh, you know, oh, I believe that. that's a myth, right? Love at first sight? See me after service. Um, how about this? Love, if you've got love, Everything in your relationships will be happy, happy, happy. No? That's a myth, too. How about love is a feeling? Even one of my favorite bands, Boston, knows that it's more than a feeling. Right? There you go. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. How about this? This is where it kind of gets serious. How about God's love? God's love is for really certain people. That's, that's a myth. Or how about this? This is one. In fact, this is a myth that I used to believe. God's love, or, or maybe let me phrase it like this. I'm too far beyond God's ability to love me. Maybe some of you have actually thought that, and that was a myth. I did a funeral yesterday, and uh, the person uh, that was uh, being uh, memorialized, their favorite verse was John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Everyone, 
I love that. It, they, just, they were clinging to that verse for their life. Here's a super popular one that I think really gets to the point of what I'm trying to talk about today. It's the idea of this is I love God. How many of you say, I love God? I love God. If you're here and you're kind of trying to figure that out, I'm so glad you're here uh, because I think all of us are still, even though we say, I love God, what does that mean and how do I live that out? But what's really common today is to say, I love God, but I just can't stand fill in the blank, all right? Everybody's got their favorite enemy, so you fill in the blank with your favorite enemy there. I love God, but I just can't stand blank, right? You know, it could be Republicans and Democrats. We're so politicized in our world today. Or it could be somebody of a different ethnicity. I can't stand blacks. I can't stand whites. I can't stand Hispanics. I can't stand Muslims. I can't stand Jewish people. I mean, on and on the list goes, right? I love God, but I just can't stand. I don't love. I'm not even sure I really like fill in the blank, how do you know what love looks like? Well, Jesus brings a lot of clarity for us, and that's what we talked about a little bit last week, is that as love is leading us, our love for God is demonstrated through our love for others. Who's your neighbor? All right? People that think like you, believe the way you do, per- person sitting next to you, person that you got in a fight with coming in the car to church today? My wife's not here, and so, uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, as a disciple, I want to confess that there's just, in my life, and maybe this is true for you too, is that it's easy to think, man, there are just some people that get under my skin, that push my buttons, uh, that I just have a hard time relating to. Well, Jesus brings such clarity to this idea of love in our day and for our age is that I can't say I love God and not love others. It's just incompatible. It does not work. It doesn't mean that everything is, uh, uh, you know, this myth of everything is happy and wonderful. No, it's not that. But it's this biblical, this agape, this overwhelming love that Jesus has for the world. If I'm a disciple, I want love to lead me. And I think that's for many of you today, is you want love to lead you. And to lead you into all your relationships, lead you into all the experiences you have. And the way we do that is as we follow Jesus, who demonstrates this is what love looks like. This is how love acts. This is how love responds in all situations. It's through the life of Christ that we have an understanding of this is love. This is love. In fact, this is my first point. Jesus loves love us. And while he was on earth, he made every effort to demonstrate that love through relationships. This was Jesus' way, this was his model, and this is what he wants to leave for us today. So Jesus loves us. Say, Jesus loves me, this I know. Well, really, Jesus tells you so, right? Yeah, it's in the Bible. It was recorded that way, but it's Jesus. He loves you, and he tells you that I love you. Now, Jesus did this before the cross. Everybody remember your BC days? How many of you like to forget your BC days? Right? I'm always concerned I'm going to run into somebody in the market and they're like, oh, I remember. Oh, yikes. Before the cross, Jesus made every effort to connect with people in very intentional ways. We're going to do a quick scripture review, write these down, and take a look at them this week. Essentially, every one of these verses is kind of the same scene, but at different times within Jesus' ministry. So I'm going to read them really quick. First John, or excuse me, John chapter 1, verse 43. Speaking of Jesus, the next day he, Jesus, purposed to go into Galilee, and he did what? He found Philip. And he said to him, follow me. This is a call to you as well. Come follow me. Uh, Luke 8, verse 1. Soon afterwards, Jesus began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. Mark 9, verse 30. There they, this is the disciples, went out and began to go through Galilee. It's that same passage, Matthew, excuse me, Matthew 9, verse 35. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Jesus was going intentionally, from town to town, to village to village, to person to person, to focus on connecting with them in a relational dynamic, in a very personal, relational way. He wanted to start building relationships, 
uh, uh, strengthening those relationships with the good news. Jesus was leading with love. It's an important dynamic for us. But it wasn't just before the cross. Now, we recognize the cross as the symbol of love from a biblical, sacrificial, powerful love. But even after the cross, what did Jesus do? He continued to demonstrate love in all relationships. In fact, Paul, the apostle who came into an understanding of that that love after the uh, resurrection of Jesus, recounts this story in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul is summarizing, he's telling the story of Christ's resurrection and his desire to connect with the disciples, connect with others. And he talks about these pre-ascension events. So we have kind of before the Christ, Jesus is ministering to the people, and people are coming and recognizing that something new is happening. And then we see this display of perfect love on the cross. Jesus gives up his life. For God so loved the world, he gave. And Jesus gave it all, gave up his life, buried and resurrects three days later, and for 40 days ministers to people, is visible before he ascends to heaven where he sits today at the right hand of the Father. In this inner ascension period, he's meeting with people. And 1 Corinthians 15, 5 says that, and that after he appeared to Cephas, or that's Peter, and then to the 12. Now, let me just pause here for a second. This is a great passage. This is, um, well, did you know that Jesus loves barbecue? <laughs> this is the passage. This is my proof text, right? In fact, this is a story you can write down, John chapter 21. Jesus has risen from the grave, and he appears to Cephas, who is? Peter, right? And Peter's doing what? Fishing, which kind of went back to kind of what he knew. Everything had been blown up. And Jesus is cooking a fish fry, barbecue for he and Peter. Right? Look it up. The Bible is powerful. Loves barbecue. He is, he is calling to Peter. And in that moment, as they're sitting around that fire, as they're feasting on that fish, even after Peter what did what? Let him down. Even after Peter <clears throat> didn't follow through on the promises that he made, here was Jesus hosting this intentional, purposeful connection between the two of them. And do you remember the questions that he asked? Do you love me? Well, of course I love you. Three times he asks him that question to solidify, I love you. I love you, Peter. Well, let's keep going. It's just a little side note. Paul is talking about this experience. Back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most are who are still living. In other words, if you have a question about this, they're still alive. Go ask them that they saw Jesus resurrected before he ascended back to the Father. Though some have fallen asleep, which is a metaphor for them, some of them have died. Then he appeared to James, and James was who? Jesus' half-brother. Then to all of the apostles, and then Paul says, and last of all appeared to me as one abnormally born. What's Jesus demonstrating? Jesus is demonstrating a powerful truth for you and I, is that love is always leading into relationships. If we say we love God, that's that vertical relationship. We have to say, it just compels us to say, I love others. These horizontal relationships. It is impossible to say, I love God, but I really don't like, I don't love, blank. It's impossible from a biblical, from a Jesus-centered perspective. So we see this, Jesus demonstrating this in his own life, leaving that example for us. And the second thing that we notice is that when love leads us, the very first followers, they experience this love through their intentional relationships. So they grabbed on to what Jesus was saying. They took it as truth, applied it into their lives, made the sacrifice to be in these intentional relationships. In fact, if you have your Bible and you want to flip over to Acts chapter 2, we're going to take a look at this passage together. Very popular passage. It's a strong passage for First Christian Church. And we try to model our life and our community after much of the early church. 
the early church example, they did everything they could to keep this connection alive uh, because they knew the strengthening that came from being together, being with one another, all that Jesus had instituted. So it wasn't about one particular person. There was many people encouraging one another, uh, uh, serving one another, demonstrating love to one another. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 48, just give this incredible picture of this. This is a strong passage for us here at FCC. It has been for years. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. I love this word devoted. It's emphatic in the original language. It's, it actually can be translated, they continued steadfastly. Some translations have that in their particular uh, uh, translation of the scripture. It implies something. It implies that there's a commitment to one another, it, 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 that there's a consistency in connecting with one another. In fact, it implies that there's a priority to connect with one another, that they devoted themselves to this and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. You see that as part of our community, right? Every week, we participate in this breaking of bread. Justin, well done. And as you led through that and the thankfulness that we have from that, we're coming back to that place that or what Jesus instituted at the Last Supper, what the early church continued to live out. We come back to that and we link ourselves to that historical theme of what God was doing, what God's up to, and that we are with one another. The idea of fellowship, again, one of these words that we don't use a lot today, but the Greek word is koinonia, and it means to have life in common. What did they have in common? They had this new law of love in common. It's not you on your own or me on my own. It's us. We're this family of faith. Uh, We've been bound together through the blood of Christ. Uh, We may have differences. We may have come from opposite ends of the political spectrum, the socioeconomic spectrum, but now we are one. We are this family in Christ. And this is the law of love. Uh, Keep going. I I get carried away here. (laughs) Verse 43. What's it say? Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders signs performed by the apostles and the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone in need. You talk, that is a picture, right, of love being exchanged between people. Real practical ways, powerful ways. This idea that there was no kind of lone wolf, isolation. I, I, I don't hear a lot today, but I used to hear it a lot, is, you know, I, I really don't need the church because it's just Jesus and me. This is so contrary to what the early church understood and the power of being in community, the family of faith together, right? No me, myself, and I ministry. This was us. Verse 46, right? The frequency of their rhythm. They came together in the temple. Now, at this particular time, as God was pouring out and miraculous things were going on, they had favor at the temple. They could go. They continued. They were all Jewish uh, descent. And as they would come together, they would continue to practice the experience of doing that Sabbath time together and the, the uh, history of all of that. And they enjoyed the favor of that for a period of time. And so they did that. But it wasn't enough. In addition, it says what? They also gathered where? In homes. Look at that. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. That wasn't simply an illustration for, hey, would you come over? We're having a barbecue today. Anybody having a barbecue today? I'm there. What time? I'm there. Uh, Right? It wasn't just that. There was something more, this smaller environment, because there was such a radical change in the way they understood faith and how they lived their, their lives as a community of faith. They needed not just this temple larger gathering, they needed this smaller gathering where people could be instructed as people were coming in and understanding the scripture. Again, they knew the story. Uh, Many of them had memorized the scriptures, the first five books. We're lucky to have the first five verses memorized, right? They had come together and they knew this history, but all of a sudden Jesus, which the entire Old Testament points to, had come and he had died and he did something radical and their lives were completely changed because of it. Now, how do I live that out? What does that mean for my life? They were just overwhelmed by love. And so they came together to encourage one another, strengthen one another. And I just want to pause right here just to simply notice this powerful truth that when love leads, people come together. And not just physical presence, obviously, that is taking place. But it's kind of coming together, what I like to say, heart and soul. Who I am. 
what I have and my gifts and, and, and the things that I can contribute to your growth and to your life and to your encouragement and to your faith. I'm coming and being a part of that as you are doing that in my life. The Holy Spirit was moving in such a powerful and unifying way. It models for us, the church today, what love looks like how love speaks, how love acts and reacts. That's why I think for many, many years we've said this, is that we love our large group gathering. Many of us make this a priority of our week. We come together, we sing together, we break bread together as, uh, as our linking back to uh, the, the first church and what Jesus instituted. We sing song together. But we also say this, is that smaller, though, is even stronger. Smaller is even better. Yeah, it takes time out of your schedule. There's a priority that's made to not just come to church on a weekly basis, but also to gather with a few other people, whether it's in a home, uh, whether it's uh, in a, a coffee shop, in a business, uh, in a park, but that action where we can come and dialogue together and share the scripture together, pray together, encourage one another, to have our faith stretched, to really grow. Here, I'm one who gets up regularly and teaches, preaches the word, but I know that the dynamic and power of being in a community with a few other people and talking about the scriptures back and forth, that's where life really explodes. That's where growth really takes off. In fact, I've been a part of small group for years for years, even prior to coming to FCC. It was just kind of ingrained in me early in my faith journey. For the last couple of years, I've done something a little different. I've been with a couple guys in a micro group, just you know, two or three of us together, and it's really taken my faith and my life into a much deeper place. Talking just struggles, questions. Um, it has been so life-giving for me on a personal level uh, that... Um, I, I've actually said this to the guys that I've met with, that had I not kind of jumped into that group, I think I would have bailed out over the last couple of years. I just, this, it is like, well, you know it. Living and live, leading and living in this particular era is like nothing else I've ever experienced. It has been such a challenge. And these guys, I think they experienced it in their environments. And to have that encouragement and say, okay, I'm not the only one <laughs> wrestling with this to speak into me. Now, here's the thing. Those of you who don't know me, you know, I could easily say I'm the last person who needs to be a part of a small group environment like that. I've walked with Christ now 36 years. I've gone to Bible college. I have a master's degree. I've been in, uh, uh, in ministry for 20 plus years now. I could say all these things and all these credentials. And at the end of it, I could say, and I'm a fool. It is that important in my life. I, I, I am excitedly looking forward towards the fall and to be reengaged back in this community. Let me ask you this question. Why? Why would Jesus demonstrate this need for community and, and, why, and the intentional community? And why would the early church model it, live it out? It's because when we are intentionally connecting with one another, that is how you live out the new commandment to love one another. That's the place. That's the environment. Yes, 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 it's in your home. But it's also in the family of faith where you're encouraging one another, you're sharing testimony, you're sharing struggles, you're sharing needs, you're sharing questions and doubts and fears where you are binding together with the body of Christ in a strong and powerful way, unlike any other. In fact, it wasn't too much after Acts that the writer to the Hebrews, the church that was meeting in Jerusalem, wrote these words. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. What are some of the habits that have come about for you in the last couple years? Maybe some are really good. 
I've actually integrated some new ones, trying to slow down, just spend some silent time with the Lord and just quietness. It's one of the reasons that we're trying to incorporate that into our community life here. But I, there's some, some things that are not such good habits. And one of them that was true for the early church, let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more, as you see the day approaching, you notice that the day is capitalized there, the day of the return of the Lord. If, it, if they were thinking about it, then ought we to be thinking about it also? In other words, early church, they lived life with this intentional focus of knowing that their faith was being formed in those intentional relational environments. It was the strength. It, it was salve to their soul. It was a priority of our life. And because they were in relationship, they knew they could find strength from one another, from the trials, from the temptations. Sneak peek. Acts chapter 2, you just go a few more pages to your right. Acts chapter 8, persecution breaks out. And all of a sudden, things change. And for a short period of time, that meeting in the temple that they had, the pleasure of that, was no longer feasible. And they were a church that was persecuted, but G Jesus used that persecution to help them take the great commandment and apply it to the great commission. And the great commission told them to go into all the earth, beyond Jerusalem, Samaria, go to the very ends of the earth, and go and share good news as you go about living your life, as you go about in intentional relationships with other believers, and inviting those who are wondering and seeking and hungering for more to life, you invite them into your community. Let me just kind of do a little shout out here. Um, I lost my note paper. Shout out. I'm going to probably forget people. I just want to shout out to those who are doing this in a very intentional way and not just being a part of a community, but helping to facilitate community. Um, I just think of so many in our church who are giving their time and their energy and their giftings to host a group in their home or host a group here on campus, or to host a group in a coffee shop, two or three people coming together. I think of all of those uh, in our Celebrate Recovery. Let me just do a shout out to Sharon and Bart, who just had this passion to launch a group this morning. <clears throat> I see Bart. Sharon, are you here? Yeah? Okay, there you are, right in front of me course, right? I was going to have them come up and sing a duet, but yeah, that's love. Um, they, they've just had this passion, this, this stirring within them for a while, and God just brought it together, and they launched a group here, and that group is open to, to be a part. If you're not in a group, you're new to FCC, and you, and you haven't made a connection with some other people, that's a perfect environment to do that in. They meet Sunday mornings right out here in the courtyard, why the weather is nice. I think it's a great opportunity. There's so many others I could kind of go through. I was just making some notes to myself this morning about all the people who've been doing it, and doing it for several years, and some who are stepping into it for the first time. These followers, these first followers that we read in the scriptures, they understood the power of community and the connection, and they knew that, that, was, that God's love was expressed in that super powerful way as they were this new family of faith coming from various dimensions of Roman society, and as they met, and they shared life, and they broke bread, and they prayed for one another, they unpacked the scripture together, the entire Roman world was flipped upside down in a relatively short period of time. In fact, that's what Acts records for us, is we just see the early church moving, not just the, quote, heroes of the faith like Peter and Paul, but just everyday people who were committed to this, to live it out. They humbled themselves. They confessed to one another. They prayed for one another. They saw signs, wonders, and miracles, and people were getting saved, experiencing the love of God. I couldn't help but think in my BC days, just prior to meeting Jesus, just three days before going to a small community group. Some of you are familiar with something called the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. 
I was far from God. I was doing my own thing, but my life was upside down. Everything that I had worshipped and I, uh, the idols in my life were just falling before me. Many of you know that. I came to that place where I just didn't think life was worth living and even contemplating taking my own life that week. And a friend invited me to come with him and hang out. And it was at a fellowship of Christian athletes. And there were about five or six people there, and they had pizza, so I was there for sure. Um, what else do you need? I was a college freshman, of course, I would be there. And I was there, and they began talking about the scriptures. I was clueless what they were talking about. I'd never heard anything like that before. But they continued to unpack, and they shared, and they were genuine. One of the guys was hurt. Uh, uh, he was a, a baseball player, and it was actually being hosted by the baseball coach of the college team. And so they said, okay, as we end tonight, let's come around, and let's just circle around, and let's pray over him. They lay hands on him, thinking, this is weird. This is weird, but there's also something really intriguing about this. And as they prayed for uh, this ball player and that he'd be healed, and then I hung out with those guys after for the rest of the evening, and I got home, I said, man, I didn't party, I didn't get in trouble. Uh, there was a number of things, and man, there's something about it. it. It wasn't so much that I heard Jesus at that mo moment say, come, follow me, but what they did is they created an environment for God to continue to work because it was just a few days later that I sat in a church just like this and I heard Jesus say, come follow me. And my life's been radically changed ever since. But that group, there was something reaching me in a very deep place. And that's why I say that smaller environment was better. It set me up to hear God in a powerful way. Bottom line is this, friends, is that when we let love lead, it naturally leads us to places to connect with one another, where we can care for one another, comfort one another, strengthen one another. And honestly, it's where we really mature. If you want to mature in your life, smaller is better. Smaller is better. This is what FCC is all about. It's helping one another live in God's grace. And when we do that, others start experiencing God's love. So I want to bless you now. What is your next step? What's your take at home right now? Holy Spirit, ask Holy Spirit right now. What's my next step? I dare you to ask that. Holy Spirit, what's my next step? If you're new to FCC, as I said, maybe it's connecting in a group, like the group that meets on Sunday morning or maybe one of the ones throughout the week here on campus. If that's you, I'd love to connect with you in the lobby after service. If you've been here and you've been at FCC for some time, I think it's that question, that prayer of, Holy Spirit, where are you leading me? Where do I take this word? Who am I connecting with? How am I pouring in to others' lives? Thanks again for joining us for today's message from First Christian Church. If you'd like to take a step in your faith and connect with a staff member at FCC, visit fccnapa.org slash connect. To stay up to date on things going on in the FCC community, we invite you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the FCC Napa YouTube channel. Have a great day.